This part's on Mormonism, and it so happens that aspects of Mormonism are one of my topics of specialty. So I'm in a position to say that Fairley's own treatment is a mixed bag. He does describe Mormon doctrine correctly, if in a somewhat oversimplified way, at the end of his vid. That's good to see. The first problem to crop up is a technical one where he calls on this source for a quote he uses on Joseph Smith and Freemasonry. This source is a little puzzling. It doesn't have any listing in the online catalog of the Library of Congress, and it isn't available for purchase on Amazon or any other bookseller. That said, the issue raised by the quote Fairley uses, that Joseph Smith and members of his family were Masons, isn't disputed, and is even freely acknowledged by Mormon authorities. But concerning allegations of Mormon ritual borrowing from Freemasonry, well, that's open to discussion. Fairley doesn't give any detailed arguments on this issue, and it's one aspect of Mormonism that I have not bothered to study. Fairley doesn't spend much time on Mormonism itself, though. Instead, he's once again hunting for symbols that he can turn into occult messages. To that extent, he offers nothing we haven't discussed before, and I won't add much to it, though I will use Fairley's own presentation for an analogy. Fairley puts his focus on pentagrams used by the Mormon Church. To illustrate the issues, I'm going to bring my focus to a debate that was had between two other parties. One of these is Bill McKeever. He's an apologist who is a specialist on Mormonism, whose opinions I have some respect for. Although in this case, there are places where I'm going to disagree with him. On the other side is a Mormon apologist, William Hamblin. Let's start with what McKeever has to say about those pentagrams. That's just me. Well, precisely. When a group uses symbols, how we perceive them is not what gives them meaning. In reply to this, Hamlin raises points like ones I've raised here. And then McKeever said the following in response. McKeever is on the right track here in one way. The real issue or problem is how modern people perceive the symbol. Hamblin, though, is on the right track in his reply. Now, as we saw in part 44 of our series, Hamblin does happen to be correct about the origins of the pentagram. But now look at McKeever's reply. Well, I did the same research, and obviously I'll say it is quite defendable, as a conclusion. McKeever also goes on to make much the same mistake Fairley does in saying the following. Well, we've already pointed out the problem here. By the same token, why ought the church give up the rainbow, or the Latin cross? McKeever makes another mistake like Fairley's when he says this. This is true, but are such websites authoritative? Well, they're not. McKeever appeals not to serious scholars, but to hobbyist websites that make undocumented claims about the pentagram being used to represent evil at the time of the Inquisition. McKeever also spots a problem for himself that Fairley should consider. Now, does that make sense? Not really. The Medal of Honor isn't a spiritual award. It has no genetic or historical connection to a pentagram. Is it really an answer to throw up your hands and say, I can't explain it, it's the government? The only satisfying answer is that symbols achieve meaning by context, not just by appearance. McKeever makes a final point that illustrates yet another problem conspiracy theorists like Fairley need to deal with. Now I have a question. Since when is the truth to be made subject to controversy? Did Jesus stop healing people because it caused controversy over the Sabbath? Did the early Christians not preach when they realized that a message about a disgracefully crucified man was controversial in the Roman Empire? Of course not. I do think the best thing to be done in such situations is to reaffirm an original symbol's meaning and to denounce its corruption. That much we do owe to observers. What we don't owe them is total abandonment of a symbol. Because if we did that, think about this. 
All a Satanist would have to do is adopt, say, the cross as we know it, or the fish symbol, as a symbol of evil, and assign new meaning to it. And then they could do the same thing to any other symbol we might have or adopt. As it happens, McKeever says that the Mormons did make one concession. They rotated some upside-down pentagrams used in certain designs so that they would be right side up. I don't think they even needed to do that much. But there is a point that McKeever makes in close that deserves some credence. Indeed so. And we can also expect to be questioned by conspiracy theorists about things like the cross of St. Peter. The least they can do, though, is respect us when we give a solid answer. Anyway, I'll rate this one half a tank. <laughs>